Good evening, everyone. I'm Jim Ladd. Tonight, you will hear part one of a four-part special interview of The Doors. In the past three years, Interview has never done a four-part special on any band. Now, after bringing some 150 artists before these microphones, you may well ask, why a four-part special on The Doors? A band whose lead singer died eight years ago, and therefore can only be talked about and not with. Well, first, I have wanted to do a show honoring this group for a long, long time. Secondly, The Doors were an entity in rock and roll that was so completely ahead of its time, not only lyrically and musically, but caused so much questioning of our perceptions that to this day, The Doors remain an unexplained and mysterious incantation that we hear, but do not quite believe. The Doors got their name from a book by Aldous Huxley entitled The Doors of Perception, a very short but fascinating piece about Huxley's personal experiments with mescaline. As you listen, you will learn just how well this name fit. Tonight, in part one of our interview of The Doors, we will talk with keyboardist Ray Manzarek, drummer John Densmore, and guitarist Robbie Krieger. And we will talk about Jim Morrison, vocalist, lyricist, and poet. We'll begin by going back, 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 back in, in time, time to 1964. 1964. And, and for, for this, this one, one I, suggest I suggest that, that you turn, turn out the lights, lights turn it on your mind, and, and come with me through an interview of the doors. doors. Is everybody in? The ceremony is about to begin. Time to live. It is now 1964. We are going to the campus of UCLA, and here we will meet Ray Manzarek. Right, that's where it all begins. It all begins at UCLA. Jim Morrison went to the film school at UCLA. Ray Manzarek went to the film school at UCLA. We met uh, in classes. The people that I knew also knew Jim. And we all sort of got together through a circle of friends and everybody started uh, hanging out together and getting stoned together. It's the first group of people at UCLA to seriously smoke marijuana. And we were the first dopers in the film school. That's when it dope first hit in my life and in America probably. Around 62, 63, 64 is when dope really started to begin, first begin to be smoked. The dope smokers in the film department all went crazy with ideas and everything. We were into the, uh, at that time, the Nouvelle Vague, the French New Wave, when Godard and Truffaut and like that all started happening in France, and Fellini first happened, and Bergman first happened, Satyajit Ray in India, and uh, in Japan, Kurosawa, and a couple of others in Japan. Cinema, the world of movies, all of a sudden became a worldwide thing. But all of a sudden, everybody got high and uh, made modern movies. And then, out of England, what should come along in 64? but the Beatles and the whole rock and roll thing, man. Incredible, far out. And then the Rolling Stones happened. And I think the Rolling Stones were the really big influence in America. They were the dope smokers. They were playing rock and roll music. And then at that point, Jim and I both said, wow, I'm gonna play rock and roll music just like that. I've always been into playing rock and roll music anyway. But this was a whole new thing to do besides making movies. I was going to now make rock and roll music, dope music. That's how The Doors really got started. The Rolling Stones blew our minds. 
So Jim was going to go to New York and um, see what was going on there, you know, like maybe get into movies there or something or, you know, whatever he was going to do. So I said, well, okay, man, I hate to see you leave Los Angeles, but there's a lot going on in L.A. And he said, yeah, I know that, but I think I'm going to go to New York. And I said, well, I'm, I'm going to stay here in L.A., so see you around sometime. And uh, that was like late May, early June. About mid-July, probably around the 4th of July weekend, I wouldn't be surprised. We're out on the beach, and uh, who comes walking down the beach but Jim Morrison. I said, hey, man, what are you doing here? And you back? And he said, no, I never left. I stayed down in Venice getting stoned and taking acid and writing songs. I said, oh, yeah, far out, man, writing songs. Because I never realized Jim could write songs. I just knew he was a good guy and did write poetry and like that, I suppose. But all of a sudden, he became a songwriter. And I said, well, you know, let me hear one of the songs. And he sang Moonlight Drive. He just sang the song out. Let's swim to the moon. Let's climb through the tide. You know, just sing the melody. Penetrate the evening that the city sleeps to hide. Let's swim out tonight, love. It's our turn to die. Parked beside the ocean on our moonlight drive. And I said, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, man. Can I hear what I could do to that? Do, 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 you know, just put it into a minor, dark, moody, funky, organy, spacey kind of thing. So that, that's how we were born. That's where the doors came from, man. Jim's lyrics and my moody music. And that's what it was. Simple as that. Let's swim to the moon. I'll tell you what happened with the doors, man. This is, uh, this is the other part of the magical meeting of the doors. First of all, Jim and I meet on the beach. Then I met John and Robbie at the Maharishi's meditation thing. That's where John and Robbie came in. And somebody said that John was a drummer. And I went to John and I said, uh, hey, uh, I've got a uh, singer and I play keyboards and we've got a, gonna get a rock and roll band together. You wanna join? And John said, yeah, I'll come down try and see how it sounds and everything. So we said, fine. So John came along and uh, we played with him and I thought John was terrific. You know, he was into jazz and stuff. He would work out just fine. And then he mentioned that Robbie, one of the guys in the meditation class, was a guitar player. So Robbie came down, played his slide guitar. We all got stoned. We didn't have a bass. We had a piano, a little uh, thing that Jim could sing through and we played Moonlight Drive and a couple of other songs after getting stoned on a beautiful day in uh, Santa Monica down by the beach. And that's where it happened, man. That first time, boom, just like that. I said, wow, that's the greatest musical experience I've ever had in my whole life up to this point. For the first time in my life, I played music. I've been in music the whole time. And that's the first time I ever really played music with John and Robbie and Jim.
and there it was. So we just took that feeling and just kept doing it one way or another and stretching it out and playing with it uh, in the studio and in person whenever we'd play live. As crazy as everyone wanted to get and as crazy as Jim got and as crazy as the audience got, John and Robbie and I would go along with the craziness and make it more crazy. And All right, here we go. We're going this way tonight. Some other nights it would be very mellow and whatever, but it was always tight. <laughs> that it was. That's the total immersion into the music. That's when you can take reality and stretch it and bend it so far that you come out on the other side. Music is sort of your gateway, your key to being absolutely real. You know the day destroys the night, night divides the day. Try to run, try to hide, break on through to the other side, break on through to the other side. We chased our pleasures here, dug our treasures there. But can you still recall the time we cried? Break on through to the other side. Break on through to the other side. I once read an article that described the sound of Ray Manzarek's organ playing as giving one the feeling that someone had just died. To me, it was always a haunting, chanting undertone of foreboding that seemed to underline the lyrics in a way that made you feel the words as well as hear them. Next, we will meet the drummer, John Densmore and explore the way in which he would, in his words, comment on the Morrison compositions. That's next, when our inner view of The Doors continues. We're back now with our inner view of The Doors. You know, to me, The Doors are the most lyrically oriented band ever to come out of rock and roll. Obviously, the poetry of Jim Morrison set to the music of The Doors has a lot to do with that. But it was the musicianship of the band that brought the words to life, and the commentary of John Densmore's lyrical drumming that gave it the punctuation. I remember when uh, I met Ray, and uh, we were going to form a band, <laughs> and then... Oh, this is funny. I met him at, uh, you know, Maharishi Meditation, right? First class ever. This was a lot, yeah, quite a while ago for yeah. TM. 65, I don't know. And uh, he said, we should get together, but the time isn't right yet. <laughs> and I thought, now that's cosmic. <laughs> you know, I mean, he's just kind of, uh. and in a few months he called me, you know, and he said, well, I've got this guy, we go to school together, and 
he's got these great lyrics, you know. And uh, I met him, and it was at Ray's garage, and he had never sang, and he just started singing. And it wasn't as full as on record, but it was just total confidence, just, oh, I'm going to be a singer. Yeah, come on. No questions asked. Nothing about singing from the diaphragm or however you're supposed to, you know, there's yeah. all sorts of concepts. And he really didn't get uh, to uh, rob a throat ever. He never had voice trouble. He just sang or yelled or whatever he was doing, but I guess he was doing it right. He just was a natural. All right, uh, John, damn it. How can anybody play drums to when the music's over? That's what I want to know. How did you ever follow oh, along? Great. Nobody believes great. it? Well, I always like to sort of play off a of gym, you know. I never could just be the timekeeper, which is the function of a drummer, primarily, but could not help just, you know, Jim would do sort of freeform stuff, and I just couldn't help commenting on whatever he would say or sing. What have they done to the earth? What have they done to our fair sister? Ravaged and plundered and ripped her and bit her. Stuck her with knives in the side of the dawn and tied her with fences and dragged her down. We just really knew each other musically and we knew Jim too, you know. It's funny, we used to, the three of us used to talk about how we could make Jim move around, sort of, you know. Like, we didn't talk to him about this, but we knew sort of how to rile him up. I mean, he'd be so stoned or whatever, but there were little things we could do where we could just make him go into some dance or something, you know. I hear a very gentle sound. with your ear down to the ground. Because he was so open, you know, just take me, you know. That, yeah, just, uh, he lived in the subconscious, it seems like, so he just, you know, he'd jump off the stage or do anything, you know. But there was a connection there, and we could kind of steer him around at times. And then, of course, other times he'd completely uh, do whatever he wanted. We want the world and we want it. We want the world and we want it. Now. Now. To be as sensitive as to just play off a of gym, and he was the incredible lyricist, and, and it just all, you know, came together. this confidence about us that when we were rehearsing uh, before we even played a club we just were gonna do it we were really gonna do it we just 
knew we had some special chemistry. I don't know, it sounds ridiculous. We just, it was just the four of us, like we, we didn't even have a bass player, you know, which is ridiculous for a rock and roll band. How can you not and have we a bass auditioned player? bass players. And every time we did, we'd go, da 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 da, R and B. No, let's leave this big hole in there for mysterious something or other. But that was it. It was more ethereal without thumpa thumpa, you know. So we didn't have a bass player. That's why I got to really get in there uh, as a drummer and play around because there wasn't, uh, there was more room, much more room. Now, when we made albums, we always had a bass player. because you have to have that punch on a record. Mm -hmm. But in person, Ray played a keyboard bass and an organ. So it was, it was just some mushy bottom, but that's about all. But there was lots of room to fill and crash around, you know. After a while, I just let it go. Play around with what Jim's doing. Let it go. And it got psychedelic. <laughs> My eyes have seen you. interview The Doors will return in a moment, and when we do, you and I will meet the first guitarist ever to use slide guitar in a rock and roll band, Robbie Krieger, when interview continues. We're back again with our interview of The Doors, and now that you've met Ray Manzarek and John Densmore, it is time to meet the person who many people believe is the most underrated guitarist in all of rock and roll. He has, among other accomplishments, been credited as the very first player to bring bottleneck guitar to the medium, and this combined with his finger-picking style and lyrical interpretation of Morrison's poetry gave the Doors a guitar sound that to this day has never been duplicated. His name is Robbie Krieger. They cut out a solo that I did in that song. Spanish Caravan? Yeah, it was a real flamenco trip, you know, and it, I guess it went on too long or something, but they cut it out. Why did they cut that out? Well, I don't remember, really. I know we spent a lot of time on it, on doing it, because it was a real intricate solo, and I remember we had to cut it up and do it in about three different sections or something. Must have spent a whole day on it, you know, and then they didn't use it. That must make you feel real good after spending that much time. <laughs> yeah, really. It's all part of the game. 
Carry me caravan, take me away. Take me to Portugal, take me to Spain. Andalusia with fields full of grain. I have to see you again and again. Take me Spanish caravan. I know you can What was the first time like when you guys, the four of you, found yourself in a room with your instruments and said, okay, let's see what this sounds like? Well, see, at that time, and I guess 65 or something like that, I wasn't in the group yet. See, John and Ray and Jim were were the group, and then Ray's brother was uh, was the guitar player, and his other brother was a harmonica player. Then Ray's brothers decided to quit because they didn't think it was happening, you know. <laughs> oh no! Oh, <laughs> and, <boy. laughs> and then uh, so they needed a guitar player, and John knew me, you know, and uh, so he brought Jim over to my house one night, and I started playing some some slide for him, you know, and Jim said, that's it, you know, he's got to be in the group. to this little place over in Santa Monica, and uh, we just kind of jammed a little bit. And Ray didn't know whether he liked my playing that well or not, because he was, he was thinking they needed somebody, a Mike Bloomfield type, you know? <laughs> the, you know, the usual hot blues guitar trip, you know. And my trip at the time was to stay as far away from your Chuck Berry blues trip as possible. part to a song, it, there was a big difference in the way you would approach that. Instead of it being, well, two verses and now a guitar break, it was like you were interpreting those lyrics. You could hear the, what was being felt and said by the way you played guitar. Very different approach in those days. How'd you come about that all of a sudden? Because you were the only cat doing that at that time. It's just probably that I didn't know how to do it any other way. You know? <laughs> 
you were play, you began with the Doors playing fingerstyle and bottleneck. Yeah, that was pretty rare at the time. In fact, I was probably the first one to use bottleneck uh, in rock and roll. Um, the only guys I'd heard that done it, had done it were, you know, like Robert Johnson and Blind uh, Willie Johnson. But I had never heard anybody play bottleneck on a rock and roll guitar at that time. Of course, Ry Cooter was doing it, and you know, but mostly acoustic in L.A. at that time. But then, right after that, a lot of people started using it. Yes, I noticed that. Yeah. Hey, bottlenecks in, okay. <laughs> Now that you've met Ray, John, and Robbie, we will hear about Jim Morrison. We're gonna have some fun tonight, right? That's next, right. when Interview continues. Right. Welcome back to part one of our four-part special Interview of the Doors. So far, we have met keyboardist Ray Manzarek, drummer John Densmore, and guitarist Robbie Krieger. It is now time to hear about the lead singer, lyricist, and poet, Jim Morrison. Me and my uh, mother and father and a grandmother and a grandfather were driving through the desert at dawn and a truckload of Indian workers had either hit another car or just, I don't know what happened, but there were Indians scattered all over the highway, bleeding to death. So the car falls out and stops. That was the first time I tasted fear. I must have been about four. Like a child, it's like a flower. His head is just floating in the breeze, man. The reaction I get now, thinking about it, looking back, is that the souls or the ghosts of those dead Indians, maybe one or two of them, were just running around, freaking out, and just leaped into my soul. And they're still there. Ray Manzarek. Now where Jim got that, where that came from, is uh, the story of the dead Indians on the highway. When he was four years old, he saw this accident, and he says that the souls of one or maybe more of those dead Indians jumped in, into his body and are still in there. And he's the only guy I ever knew that was that interested in that sort of thing and could sort of become it on stage. And it wasn't like his background at all. He comes out of a uh, military background. His father was in the Navy and a very uh, standard military uh, American upbringing, very nice white clean upbringing, and yet there was that Indian side of him too. And I always wondered where that came from. And then one day he told me that story, and I thought to myself, that's it, man, that explains it, absolutely. There are two people in there. There's Jim Morrison, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, and there's Jim Morrison, some dead Indian, some American Indian in there, 
who took refuge in that soul of that four-year-old child, in the body of that four-year-old child, because that Indian was so shocked by being killed in this automobile accident that the soul, that Indian soul, wasn't prepared to leave his body or to leave the earth, and immediately looked for refuge and saw this four-year-old child, and Jim says, child is like a flower, man, his head is just floating in the breeze, and the breeze blew in an Indian soul, and just, whoom! I'm taking this one for myself. Indians scattered on dawn's highway bleeding, ghosts crowd the young child's fragile eggshell mind. Jim used to do Indian things on stage, man, with his speech, and Indian voices would sometimes come out of him. And I'd go, my God, what's going on with that guy? I know the guy is brilliant and incredible, but God, it's almost like he's possessed. And then when he told me the story, I realized that he was possessed. It was fortunately of a benign spirit, a good Indian, a good American Indian. And that was Jim Morrison, God and the devil, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, and an Indian. Couldn't be further opposite, Indian and the son of a Navy admiral. People are strange when you're a stranger. Faces look ugly when you're alone Women seem wicked when you're unwanted Streets are uneven when you're down When you're strange Faces come out of the rain When you're strange No one remembers your name When you're strange When you're strange When you're Strange People are strange When you're a stranger Faces look ugly When you're alone Women seem wicked When you're unwanted Streets are uneven When you're down When you're strange, no one remembers your name. When you're strange, when you're strange, when you're strange. All right, John Densmore. It was like he was carrying this giant weight around, a medicine ball, of the problems of everything. I couldn't understand why he was always so down or stoned or crazy or some thing, you know. And now, with a little few years perspective, I, I can see, you know, that he was troubled about lots of things. And, you know, I was more concerned about him not getting fat or looking good for a gig or something, you know, which, in retrospect, he was an amazing guy, you know. When I read his poems, just wish he was alive, that's all. But I knew that he knew I disapproved when he completely was, you know, blowing his brains out in one way or another. You know, he was self-destructing. But I couldn't get myself to tell him, you know. I can see your face in my mind. I can see your face in my mind.
you cry Baby, please don't cry Robbie Krieger. Well, I think one thing that, that I could say was that Morrison was the only, if not one of the few, um, performers that I knew that really believed it, what he was saying, you know. He lived that life, you know. He, you know, he wasn't just up there uh, doing his trip and then you'd go home and then watch TV and, and have a beer and, and laugh at it all, you know and laugh all the way to the bank. He was a guy that, uh, he lived that life he, that he lived out on stage all the time. And when he went home, it was to some cheap motel somewhere, and he just, just hung out until the next show, you know? Sometimes, like, he would be the most great guy you've ever wanted to meet, you know? He'd just be super polite or and, uh, together, and clean and everything else, you know, but then the next day he'd be completely the other way. But, you know, all those stories are true, most of them. And, like, you know, he lived, his whole life was right on the edge, you know. And that's why, and people could sense that when he was on stage, that, you know, there was always something under there ready to happen. And, you know, if they were lucky that night, it might happen, you know. All I can say is that he was totally committed to, uh, living the life of the revolution. Once again, Robbie Krieger. Another thing I wanted to mention was that about the whole, the poetry aspect of Jim, you know, that he should really be recognized as one of the, not just some rock and roll poet or something, but, you know, really one of the important poets of this uh, last 50 years, you know. John Densmore. Maybe Jim had a more sociological importance than uh, that has uh, yet to come out. I think so. Because I keep getting into his stuff, you know, and you know, I'm just beginning to understand the lyrics. <laughs> no, you know, I mean, there's a lot of depth in there. I think that hasn't come out that much, and it will more, and if it can, still musically terrific. And finally, Ray Manzarek. He was the lyricist. He was the guy who uh, sang the words, incredible words, man. God almighty, Jim's words were just incredible. And he had a great sense of rock and roll, of the music of rock and roll. So we saw eye to eye on uh, the musical structure of rock and roll and uh, the words. I was always uh, just completely enamored of his words. Terrific lyrics. Well, the clock says it's time to close now. I guess I better go.
As I stated at the beginning of tonight's show, I've waited a long time to bring this program to radio. I felt that part one of this four-part special should be used to introduce you to the principal players whom you've met tonight. As we progress through the next three weeks, you will hear from Alice Cooper, Bill Graham, Carrie Livgren of Kansas, and some friends who were with The Doors and whose stories may shock you. Also, we will bring some unreleased material never before heard on radio, and of course, the music of this sometimes frightening, sometimes risky, but always poetic band known as The Doors. Join us next week, same time and same frequency, for part two of our interview of The Doors. I'm Jim Ladd. Lions in the street and roaming, dogs in heat, rabid, foaming, a beast caged in the heart of a city. The body of his mother rotting in the summer ground, he fled the town, went down south and crossed the border, left the chaos and disorder back there over his shoulder. One morning he awoke in a green hotel with a strange creature groaning beside him. Sweat oozed from its shiny skin. Good evening, everybody. I'm Jim Ladd. Tonight, part two of our four-part special interview of The Doors. Last week, we met keyboardist Ray Manzarek, drummer John Densmore, and guitarist Robbie Krieger. And we learned how The Doors began in Venice Beach, California, and a glimpse of what was to lie ahead. The ceremony tonight will include a rather graphic interview of the lives of Ray, Robbie, John, and of course, the lead singer, lyricist, and poet, Jim Morrison. Is everybody in? The ceremony is about to begin. Tonight, we'll again talk with Ray Manzarek, Robbie Krieger, and John Densmore. Plus, we'll meet The Doors' manager, also a man who's writing a book on Morrison's life, and longtime friend of The Doors, Alice Cooper. Later in the show, we'll meet concert promoter Bill Graham. Now, as I warned you last week, some of these stories may shock you, but they are real. And as you will hear, an important part of tonight's interview of The Doors. Wake up! You can't remember where it was. Had this dream stopped? It would be untrue You know that I would be a liar If I was to say to you Girl, we couldn't get much higher Come on, baby, light my fire Come on, baby, light my fire Try to set the night on fire the time you hesitate is through The time you wallow in the mind Try now we can only lose And our love become a funeral pyre Come on baby, light my fire Come on baby, light my fire Try to set the night on fire The Doors guitarist, Robbie Krieger. LSD? Well, for me, anyway, I think. I guess the other guys, too. I can't speak for them, but, you know, it was the whole uh, religious experience, mysticism itself, you know. And, uh, you know, you had always heard about it when you were a kid, you know, because if you go to Sunday school or whatever, but it don't mean jack shit to you because you were, you know, you are told about it and you just, ah, who wants to believe in God and all this crap, you know. 
you know, let's see something. Let's see it. When I was back there in seminary school, there was a person there who put forth the proposition that you can petition the Lord with prayer. When you take acid, you felt that, you know? And especially during those days uh, when acid was something, when I took it anyway, acid was a brand new thing and nobody had, had uh, been able to dilute it or, you know, do the things that... Put the other yeah, things in it. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, we had the, the good stuff and, uh, man, it was pretty amazing, you know. It really uh, opened your eyes to uh, the fact that there was something else happening. You know there's something happening, but you don't know what it is. I think that was probably the most important uh, thing that happened in the 60s was LSD. LSD, 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 LSD. LSD, LSD, LSD. No time to hesitate is through No time to wallow in the mire Try to weaken our hills And our love become a funeral pyre Come on baby, light my fire Come on baby, light my fire Try to set the night on fire Morsonate acid like people smoke joints. Danny Sugarman, then the youngest member of the Doors office staff, and now Morrison biographer. The Doors were the house band at the Whiskey. I think they were opening for Love or Van Morrison. And Jim was staying at the Tropicana, and um, Ray and, and John go down to get him. Ray doesn't show up for the first set, and Ray sings. And they go down to the Tropicana, and they're knocking on Jim's door. Come on, Jim, we know you're in there. Open up, man. Door cracks open, and you see this one eye, man, just blazing with life and vision. And Jim opens the door, and he's standing there naked, and he's just got hands full of acid tabs. Jim Morrison had an incredible ability to hold drugs, and they took him up to the whiskey. And finally they get to their last song and Jim's going into the end and then he starts improvising. And it was really the first Doors improvisation. Everybody, anybody that saw the Doors knew that Jim would launch to incredible cascades of poetry. Just incredible, man. What a genius. And he gets to the part, the killer awoke before dawn. He put his boots on. He took a face from the ancient gallery and he walked on down the hall. He went into the room where his sister lived and then he paid a visit to his brother and then he he walked on down the hall And he came to a door And he looked inside Father, yes son, I want to kill you Father, yes, son, I want to kill you. Mother, I want to. And 
I can't say it on the radio, but he said it loud and clear and repeated it about 30 times. And the manager shut off the PA and said over the microphone, you guys are crazy, you're fired. Mother, I want to We've all experienced some expansion of consciousness through chemical changes in our body, and I don't just mean taking acid. The Doors manager, Bill Siddons. And I think that Jim began a kind of search and exploration that he did somewhat as a game and uh, somewhat as a researcher to find out what the hell he was capable of. And I think that his world famous intake of uh, large quantities of acid and alcohol and that kind of stuff was somehow connected to that. We'll be back with our inner view of the doors and special guest Alice Cooper in just a moment. I'm Jim Ladd. And we're back again with tonight's interview of The Doors. As you listen to these accounts of The Doors as they unfold, I want you to keep in mind that these are not stories of self-indulgent party-goers, but the true life adventures of people who were exploring the limits of life and death, musically, chemically, or as in the later years, Morrison's exploits with alcohol. Well, show me the Once again, Doors manager Bill Siddons. I don't think it was just because he was uh, pretty crazy and uh, liked to get drunk now and then, because sometimes he did things that seemed like very conscious attempts at getting somewhere else. Ladies and gentlemen, Alice Cooper. Because I do believe in their natural survivors and there are natural people that have a will to be somewhere else, you know, to be on another plane, another planet, whatever death is just not being satisfied with, with what they're doing on this planet creatively. I mean, look at the things he wrote, you know, I mean, he was so obvious in his lyrics that he was going to be going out pretty soon. Not to touch the earth, not to see the sun, nothing left to do but run, 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 let's run, let's run. House upon the hill, Moon is lying still, shadows of the trees, witnessing the wild breeze. Come on, baby, run with me. Let's run.
fall out of second story windows drunk and, and never go to the doctor with broken you know arms and legs and things you know and perform that day once again alice cooper i saw him jump out of an mg one night going along in topanga canyon just jumped out is that right and i said what are you doing man <laughs> i said wow that's cool and i realized that was not cool you know he, he pretty much just burned himself out but I mean, what a brilliant talent the man was. I am a lizard king. I can do anything. He just packed it all in 27 years. He was incredible. He just, whatever came along, he did. John Densmore. Okay, when I first met him, I used to smoke. 10 joints in the morning and get up. Then acid came in and he, <laughs> I saw him take 10,000 micrograms of acid at the Tropicana. This is when we were playing uh, <laughs> after hours at the Hullabaloo. Oh, in retrospect, it's hysterical. At the time, you know, we were trying to be together and, you know, we'd all plan to be together and do it and way well, you're fing up. But anyway, then he got on to booze. And he got on the booze. And uh, that's as far as I went, as I know what he was on to. And as far as my knowledge, he was not on to anything else, i.e. heavy drugs, uh, smack, whatever. I mean, he just took to those three things so heavy as they came up. It, he he might have packed it all in 27 years. His the little organs in there went, oh, Jim, OK, man. <laughs> I am a lizard king. I can do anything. Uh, I guess Jim was one of those people you really couldn't stop when he wanted to do things. Bill Siddons. He laughed at death. And he, uh, I mean, he got on top of an 11 or 12 story building, whatever it is, and walked around the outside edge. I've seen film of it. It makes me insane to watch it. I mean, he did a lot of those kind of things. He jumped out of the window in the 16th floor of a hotel in Washington within the first month I was with him. But he grabbed a ledge on the way out, freaked out the two girls that were with him, and he laughed. He thought it was funny. <laughs> Doors keyboardist, Ray Manzarek. You don't think madness exists? The empty, void madness when you're insane? That's exciting to play with. That's there for the nighttime. That's there from when we want to get a little crazy. And uh, the solar system has it planned so that every once in a while we do get crazy. The full moon makes us crazy, for one. 
And that happens twice a month. We can go through some real good, crazy nighttime periods because the moon gets full and it tends to do a watery thing and we get into a much more romantic, voluptuous mood. So that's what the door is. That's when the door is played. And we played with madness and played with uh, the craziness right on the other side of the whole thing. Strange days have found us. Strange days have tried us down. They're going to destroy. one guy that used to come around uh, he wanted to sing and to make his voice sound like Jim he burnt his throat with a cigar down the inside of his throat and burnt his throat and talked like and sounded like Jim and was always hanging around and we used to call him cigar pain and nobody knew his name and they'd say oops cigar pain is here and you'd hear him outside singing through the air vent Oh my God, and he's here again. We kept trying to get him away and had the, the police actually had to come one or two times and take him away and he'd be back two, three weeks later. Oh, he's here again. Cigar pain. Yeah, but finally he left and uh, somebody heard that uh, about a year or two ago he killed his mother and then blew his brains out. Mm. And that's the story of cigar pain. So, you made it, man. On the radio. All hail the American night. What was that? I don't know. Sounds like guns, thunder. Our interview of the Doors now turns to an area of their career that has absolutely no parallel in all of rock and roll. 
their concerts. In the beginning, people did not simply go and watch the Doors play their music, applaud and go home. When you attended a Doors concert, you became part of an experiment. Some say that the experience was so completely enthralling that you lost all sense of time. And when it was over, you weren't sure if you had been there for five minutes or five years. The Doors, unlike any band before or since, and without the use of lasers, flash pots, or special effects of any kind, took their audiences with them on journeys to places unknown. They were the tour guides, as the audience followed into a void that was both frightening and beautiful. All right, now look. Look, we, we've seen a lot of things happen in the city. Everything's turned around. Everything's beautiful. Nobody thought we'd be able to bring the doors here, and we did. But we got a couple of things. Wait a second, man. Look, we just got a couple of little things that we got to tell you about. You either got to sit down, or you got to go back to your seats, you got to make aisles, or well, that's it, man. You got to move back. Wait a second, hold on. Let's have a little help, man. Come on, everybody go back to their seats. People are going to get hurt up here, and they're going to pass out, and we don't want it, man. And the doors don't want it either. Ray Manzarek. Playing music on stage, I mean, for us to get the whole thing together, it's, it's all a heavy reality trip, you know, for us to get the whole thing together and get onto a stage with all our equipment in, say, in Philadelphia, from Los Angeles. Hey, Philadelphia! Do you feel all right? Plus, a whole bunch of people come, everybody comes in their cars. It's, Big reality. You get into this place, man. It's a, it's a heavy reality trip. A lot of hassle to go through to get into that concert on both our sides, audience and performers. But then once we're there and we all settle down, it's like we all get stoned together, is what it is. You know, it's like here we are, and there's like 15,000 of us, 15,000 people all stoned. Okay, let's go. Let's play some music. Ladies and gentlemen, from Los Angeles, California, the door! And uh, we'd go on trips, the whole audience and the band, and we'd all immerse ourselves in the music and have a Hell of a good old time. I'll keep you out on the road, you hand upon the wheel. I'll keep you eyes on the road, you hand upon the wheel. Come to the road, that's gonna have a real a good time. Yeah. John Densmore. It was a religious experience between us and the audience. Sometimes those early days at the Fillmore in New York, whew, you know, it was just scary at times. Maybe Jim would get hurt or something, not from the audience attacking us or anything, just that it got so heavy. We just wondered if something weird was going to happen, you know, because Jim was so intense, you know. Like I said, it was religious. It was just. We were all, I mean, this sounds really, we were all together, but we were together, the audience and us. They just went crazy. Everybody went, yeah! And that was it. It was 
just incredible. Everybody was together, a feeling, a community. You gotta roll, 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 gotta feel my soul all right. Roll, 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 gotta feel my soul. You gotta chop the food, come, come, get down to cheat on. Bum, 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 beep, bum, balula, come, don't you cheat, no, no. Eat the don't you cheat, eat that dog. Concert promoter and founder of the Fillmore East and West, Bill Graham. He was very stubborn, and uh, he was very uh, demanding, very broody on the stage. And uh, in the Fillmore in San Francisco, the old Fillmore, he walked on stage one night. He was pretty loaded. He liked to swing the microphone around a lot, and uh, he started waving this thing over the audience. And I got out there, and the way he was doing it was just right in front of him was the area where he was swinging it. And I figured, I'll go down there, and if, it, if he does drop it anyway, he was just, he said, drop it and just pick it up in time. I didn't want it to, I mean, it was hard, it's a microphone. I figured, I'll go down there and try to stop it. So I run down and walk the stage into the, into the front of the stage, and I'm trying to catch it, and sure enough, it lands. It lands right on my head, and it made a big lump, and I mean, I really got furious. Of, of the 3,000 people there, he had to hit me. And after the show, I said, you've got to be careful. It wasn't, it wasn't me. There's a lawsuit. She says, sure, it's my act. I'm, you're not going to tell me what to do. It was sort of strained. So the next time he came back, he asked me to come up to the dressing room, and he gave me this gift. And I opened the box, and it was, it was one of those jungle pith helmets painted in psychedelic colors, and it said, the Morrison special. He said, now you're safe. Robbie Krieger. Yeah, he definitely had a different way of doing everything. But, you know, one point that we haven't discussed is the aspect of, of terror that he would instill sometimes, you know, which uh, I, th I think is an important part of, of his personality and which I think the audience would feel sometimes, you know. Sometimes he'd just take it to the edge. Now, run to the mirror in the bathroom, look! She's coming! of her moving I let my cheeks slide down the cool smooth tile feel the good cold stinging blood the smooth Once again, John Densmore. And he'd stick the microphone down into somebody's mouth down there. 
come on, what do you got? What do you have to say about yourself? You know, and so it got kind of rowdy. You know, and there was a lot of this, uh, and he would wait. There'd be long silences where we'd be riffing and the music's over forever. I'd run out of fills and he'd wait longer. But he'd do it just to get the audience kind of to squirm a little and then maybe say something. Shut up! Now, is that any way to behave at a rock and roll concert? You don't want to hear that for the next half hour, do you? Uh, all right, shh, shh, shh. Come on, come on, come on. Damn, give, give the singer some, man. Hi. Jim got a reputation for being this uh, incredibly spontaneous performer on stage and did things that, no, you know, I mean, the guy jumped off an eight-foot stage into a crowd, made no provisions for landing on his feet or anything, just dove. He did things like that that were what your normal straight people would call insane, but they made you readjust your thinking. The Doors manager, Bill Siddons. And it made you grip your chair. It gave you white knuckles. And from there, they would build out into a, a musical passage that just built an intensity and tempo until they got to the point of bam, and Jim let out a scream. <laughs> A lot of bands built their music up to that point of orgasm. The Doors were the only band that ever took it beyond there. When Jim screamed, the orgasm wasn't just built to and left. It was there, four, five, six seconds, whatever. You felt all this release, this tension leaving your body slowly. And then the music moved right down into a place where it wrapped its arms around you and took you on right back into it. I'm Jim Ladd. We'll be back with the conclusion of part two of our four-part interview of The Doors in just a moment. We're back again with our interview of The Doors. And so far tonight, we've heard many stories of the unreality and the craziness that surrounded The Doors, both on stage and off. 
Now, it is time to bring all of these stories into perspective. As I said earlier, these were not self-indulgent party-goers, but visionaries who believed in what they were doing. They lived the life that they portrayed in their music with the conviction of true revolutionaries who were committed to their vision of change. Ray Manzarek. That's why we got jumped on, I guess. Yeah, we were revolutionaries. A revolutionary rock and roll band. God, that's what the Doors were. And the only message the Doors ever preached was freedom. That's the joke of it all. Just freedom. Individual human rights. Tell all the people that you see Follow me Follow me down Tell all the people that you see Set them free Follow me down You tell them they don't have to run We're gonna pick up everyone Come on, take me by my hand The wonder at your feet, your life's complete. Follow me down, can't you see me growing? Get your guns, the time has come to follow me down. Follow me across the sea where milky babies seem to be molded, flowing revelry. The one that set them free Tell all the people that you see It's just me Follow me down What happened was we were singing about the revolution. Robbie Krieger. Well, you know, we were never really protagonists of the flower movement. <laughs> In fact, we were the complete opposite, you know, because what was happening with that trip was that, you know, all these hippies and everybody were going, ah, oh, love and peace and everything's great, you know, but really, you know, that was only half of the side of the coin, and, you know, we were sort of uh, providing a glimpse of the other side as well, and, uh, you know, there always has to be a balance. Walk across the floor with a flower in your hand Trying to tell me no one understands Trading your hours for a handful of dimes Gonna make it, baby, in our prime Come together one more time The Doors manager, Bill Siddons. I think the music initially reflected what was happening in, in a very small part of the culture and everybody was ready for the message. And they said, absolutely, to hell with this. We're not going to do it this way. We're going to try it ourselves. The human race was dying out. Finally, Ray Manzarek. 
you just got to throw, throw your life away, man. Don't hang on to your life so hard. You know, you will succeed. That's the joke of it. If you make that great leap and say, oh, hell, I'm going for the good time. I'm going to have some fun. If you go ahead and do that, uh, you'll find that you'll succeed at uh, whatever you do. Whether it's making music or uh, making pottery or being a construction worker, working with wood. But go ahead and do it, man. You'll really enjoy it, and you'll probably succeed at it. As a matter of fact, maybe it's a law, maybe it's a law of karma that uh, we'll find out, that if, uh, maybe this is the way God has it planned, if you take that existential leap, as they call it, or just make that leap and say, I'm going to do what I want, maybe you automatically succeed. Maybe that's the secret that's waiting uh, for humanity to discover, man, that every man can take that leap across reality and just say I'm gonna do what I want and he will succeed because of the vibrations of the cosmos are set up that way I hope you enjoyed tonight's interview of The Doors. Please join us next week, same time and same frequency, for part three of this four-part special interview. I'm Jim Ladd. Good evening, everybody. I'm Jim Ladd. And tonight, part three of our four-part special interview of The Doors. If you were with us for part one of this show, you heard how The Doors keyboardist Ray Manzarek, drummer John Densmore, guitarist Robbie Krieger, and Jim Morrison met in Venice Beach, California, and how The Doors began. In part two, we explored the beginnings of an unbelievable sojourn that took Morrison to places most people have never ventured through the abundant use of acid, grass, and alcohol. Tonight, during part three, we'll begin by setting the mood of the times. It was the late 60s. People were in the streets. Revolution was in the air. And the doors were making music for the birth of a newborn awakening. Awake. Shake dreams from your hair, my pretty child, my sweet one. Choose the day and choose the sign of your day, the day's divinity, first thing you see. A vast, radiant beach and a cool, jeweled moon. Couples naked race down by its quiet side. And we laugh like soft, mad children, smug in the woolly, cotton brains of infancy. Music and voices are all around us. Choose, they croon, the ancient ones. The time has come again. Choose now, they croon, beneath the moon, beside an ancient lake. 
Enter again the sweet forest. Enter the hot dream. Come with us. Everything is broken up in dances. The Doors keyboardist, Ray Manzarek. Uh, we were just psychedelic, man. Just a bunch of psychedelic guys down in Venice, getting high and making some music, and trying to spread the word, spread the feel, spread the feel of what it was like to be high in Venice uh, back in the middle 60s. And boy, it was a great feeling. Stand on that beach and watch that sun set into the ocean. at peace, man, at peace with the world, and at one with the universe, and all that sort of thing. And uh, it happened. It really happened. Changed my life, and I am never going to change my vision any other way except what I started to do in the doors, what the doors did, and I'm just going to continue on with that same vision. We'll now meet The Doors manager, Bill Siddons, and hear his view on why this incredible cultural explosion was taking place. For me, it's kind of a chicken or the egg thing. Did the music start it or did the people start it? And some of those people happen to be making music. I don't really know the answer to the question. I just know that there was a whole culture ready to make some changes and try to take control of their own lives, and The Doors played a very big role in, in affecting that change, I think. Well, I think the point is that the, the revolution that we were fighting has happened. The Doors guitarist, Robbie Krieger. We never said to ourselves, okay, we've got to do this because this, that, or the other. I mean, it's just the way things came out. You know, we never sat down and said, okay, we're going to cause a revolution here. And no. We were just a mirror of the society. But and you must have seen that you were causing something to happen. Not really. I mean, yeah, we were helping it to, along, maybe, but we didn't. You know, we didn't come up with the idea or anything. But, you know, a rock and roll mirrors the society just like any other art f form does, you know. And, you know, maybe, true, we were ahead of our time, maybe a couple of years. But still, all in all, we were just a reflection of what was to come. Dead cats, dead rats, did you see what they were at all right? Dead cat in a top hat. Woo! Sucking on a young man's blood. Wishing he could come, yeah. Sucking on the soldier's brain. Wishing it would be the same. Thanks. 
The Doors drummer, John Densmore. We didn't sit down and have a meeting and say, hey, you know, we want to change the minds of people. We didn't say it, but we, we enjoyed doing it. We could see it happen. We could feel it in concerts that sociologically, besides musically, it was affecting people. And God, what a, what a high that is. I'm proud of that, that's for sure. You know the day destroyed the night. I'm Jim Ladd, and as we begin this portion of tonight's interview at the Doors, we find that things are about to take a turn for the worse. Up until now, the Doors had enjoyed the ultimate respect of their audiences and an almost religious-like following. But gradually, as the Doors became internationally famous, Morrison was singled out as a sex symbol, a rock idol, a Greek god with a microphone. Suddenly, their audiences who the Doors had always felt so close to, and at one with, changed. No longer were they willing to become participants in a Doors concert excursion into the void. The crowds of rock and roll explorers became a mob of weekend voyeurs who came not for adventure, but to see a freak show. The audience no longer saw Jim Morrison as the lyricist and poet who used stage theatrics to communicate. They now wanted Morrison to, in quotes, do his act. The obvious flaw is that to Jim Morrison, it never was an act. This change in the audience and a growing and uncontrollable fear of the doors on the part of the police and government officials so clouded and confused the message of the doors music that the once almost reverent communication between the doors and their audience became lost in the screams of the crowds and the sirens. When you guys were in the midst of this, uh, of the most controversial part of the doors, when the heat was getting real, when the real heat heavy, was on, when the heat was on, when the narcs were backstage looking for dope, and when the vice squad was backstage waiting for obscenities with, with photographers and uh, with uh, tape recorders and plain clothes narcs were backstage. Yeah, those were the Ooh, days, huh? Jesus Christ, man, was that hairy? God. Jim was hauled off the stage way at the beginning in New Haven. That's before Miami, before any real trouble started to go down. Jim was hauled off the stage by the police. Can you recreate that for us? I'd like to hear the result of that. All right, Jim, uh, this is in uh, New Haven, a tough little town. So uh, we get to the concert. Uh, Jim got there a little early and went backstage by himself into the dressing room. And there was maybe one or two other people were there. And some chick came in and uh, 
wanted to uh, make out with Jim. So they did. They went into another room, and a cop walks in and says, hey, what are you two doing here? And Jim said, oh, well, I'm, uh, I'm in the band. Uh, you know, we're, we're playing here in the doors. The guy said, what? Come on, clear this area out. The van's on stage. You guys get out of here. And then they started fighting. They started shouting. Jim said, well, yeah, da, da, da. and the cop said, yeah, so the cop pulled out his mace, his can of mace, and shot Jim in the face with it. And then finally, our manager shows up and says, oh, wait a minute, this guy is the lead singer of the band. And he shows him the official pass oh. that Jim didn't have. And the guy goes, oh, gee, oh, <laughs> wow, well, wow, I'm really sorry. So the cop splits, and uh, Bill took Jim into the dressing room. And uh, Jim was really wrecked from it, man. Uh, you know, the tears, and oh, his, yeah. whole, his eyes, and the gaskets in your lungs, and he was sobbing and everything, and had a his face was all red. So it finally cleared after about a half hour. He was okay, and then we get on stage. Ladies and gentlemen, the doors. And halfway through the set, man, he decides to tell the story of what happened and start to put the cops down for being pigs. And he gets into the story and just starts telling the story exactly the way it happened. And, and uh, then he starts working the audience up and screaming about the cops. And they ran on stage and grabbed him and took him away. They said, stop, you've gone far enough. You're making us look bad. And he was making them look bad. He was telling the story the way it happened and the cops were looking like fools. It was a lot of fun. We all had a real good time. I'll be <laughs> lots of fun in New Haven on that night. Blood in the streets in the town of New Haven. Blood stains the roofs and the palm trees of Venice. Blood in my love in the terrible summer. Bloody red sun of fantastic L.A. John Densmore. We were misunderstood by this, these straight people, and then it was the long hairs versus the straights, and we were totally 100% misunderstood by them, and that's what we wanted, <laughs> liked, you know, I mean, that, it was them versus us, and uh, that was, oh boy, we'd love to shock them. I mean, you know, we were out there to do it. At this point, the Doors would now engage in the ultimate catharsis in their concert career, Miami. Here in the South, in Morrison's home state, in the heart of redneck heaven, Jim Morrison is accused of exposing himself on stage. Robbie Krieger. The South would not have been the place I would have picked to done that. No. But it was the logical place for Jim to do that. <laughs> because he was from the South and that probably represented his home to him if he had one, you know. Although he didn't do it. That's the funny part about it. And when we say it, I guess the common rumor is that he <laughs> dropped his pants. Right. And, and he did not do that. No. At least not that I saw. And I was standing pretty close to him on stage. You were there, so you would... Yeah. What happened oh, there? Oh, God, it was just total chaos. You know, it was like, you know, first of all, he was wasted, drunk. And, you know, he was just storming around the stage and... Uh, screaming and yelling and we were trying to play you know as we often did trying to keep it together the three of us you know by playing songs and hitting different cues that he would spontaneously uh, come up with something on you know but even those weren't working that night because the audience was just yelling and screaming and he was yelling and screaming back You're all a bunch of Slaves. What are you gonna do about it? 
What are you gonna do about it? What are you gonna do about it? What are you gonna do? It wasn't a riot, I wouldn't say, but it was like a chaos, you know? And, you know, he took his shirt off, which is no big deal. And then he may have taken his uh, pants down. He didn't take them all the way down. He may have unbuttoned them, you know? And although I wasn't even noticing anything like that, because, you know, that was, you know, who gives a shit if somebody's gonna take his pants off if there's all hell is breaking loose? Bill Siddons. They did a couple of songs, and then Jim started rapping to the audience. And he used nasty words. He said, you know, things like, are you, are you going to let the people of this world rub your face in the shit of this world for the rest of your life? You're going to do something about it. Um, he was coherent. His message was, it was just, instead of couching it in subtle, poetic kind of terminology hidden in a song, he got out and really talked to his audience. Hey, I'm not talking about no revolution. I'm not talking about no demonstration. I'm not talking about getting out in the streets. I'm talking about having some fun. I'm talking about dancing. I'm talking about love your neighbor till it hurts. I'm talking about grab your friend. I'm talking about love, 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 love. The whole thing kind of turned into pandemonium. There were uh, kids jumping all over the stage, so all of a sudden there were police on the stage throwing the kids off. The promoter's brother was a karate expert. He was karate chopping people. You know, there was all this craziness going on. And there was this mixture of songs and speeches and whatever that was coming off the stage. It was really the most unique and weird concert ever. And Jim got into a thing where he was talking to his audience and saying, what do you want from me here? I came here to play you some music. What do you, what do you expect? What do you want? Hey, listen, I am lonely. I need some love, you all. Ain't nobody gonna love my ass. Come on. I need you. There's so many of you out there. Nobody's gonna love me, sweetheart. Come on. Hey, there's a bunch of people way back there that I didn't even notice. Hey, how about about 50 or 60 of you people come up here and love my ass? Come on. Yeah. I love you. Come on. I think what, what happened is, is this thing of Jim exposing himself came out because Jim was saying, is this what you want from me? And I believe he had unbuttoned his pants. It was just total chaos, you know. I think most people had a good time. <laughs> Even though that not much music was played, you know, you couldn't really call it a concert. But, and then what happened was the press got a hold of the thing and they said, well, he whipped it out or something. And then the warrant was issued for his arrest about a week later. Once again, Robbie Krieger. <laughs> and so it was totally ridiculous, you know, but it ruined our career for at least a year and probably was one of the contributing factors to the demise of the Doors. Really? Mm -hmm. You think that that ruined your career at that time? Oh, it did, because first of all, nobody would hire us, you know. All the hall managers were had a little letter saying, hmm, these guys, no, no, you know. So nobody would hire us in any decent hall, and they banned our records on most top 40 stations. They wouldn't touch it. Maybe some underground stations, but... Yeah. And the same thing happened when we were got busted up in uh, Connecticut, which was totally ridiculous too. But uh, right after that happened, they, you know, "Love Me Two Times" was just out as a single, and they took it right off the air. Love me two times, baby. Love me twice today. Love me two times, girl. I'm gone away. Love me two time, girl. One for tomorrow, one just for today. Love me two time, I'm gone away. Love me one time, do not speak. 
Our interview of The Doors returns in a moment, and when we come back, we'll look at the change in Jim Morrison from rock and roll sex star to poet. We're back again with our interview of The Doors. So far, we have heard how the Doors began their incredible sojourn with a revolutionary vision, a dream to make music that would touch people, make them react, and to make them think. This to the Doors was the goal, not a vehicle by which to achieve some sort of stardom. And as difficult as it may be to understand in today's world of multi-million dollar record sales and rock and roll bands who from the very beginning sold their artistic souls for the platinum prize, Jim Morrison's fame and fortune was to him a mockery of the very music that he created. Resident mockery, give us an hour for magic. We of the purple glove, we of starling flight and velvet hour, we of Arabic pleasures breed, we of sundom in the night. Give us a creed to believe, a night of lust. Give us trust in the night. Give of color hundred hues, a rich mandala for me and you. And for your silky pillowed house, a head, wisdom, and a bed. Trouble decree, resolute mockery has claimed thee. The Doors manager, Bill Siddons. He was one who um, read the great writers and was uh, very, very knowledgeable about books and uh, about poetry. He was into Rimbaud. He started out studying Nietzsche. And he studied a lot of the great minds of uh, some of the great poets and philosophers and writers, he was incredibly knowledgeable about that stuff. One of the games he used to play, he uh, would challenge someone who was in his house to pick up a book, any book from the bookshelves, and read either a sentence or a paragraph from the book. Don't tell him what it is, he'd turn his back, and he'd tell him what book, what chapter. Did you know freedom exists in a school book? Did you know madmen are running our prison within a jail, within a gale, within a white free Protestant maelstrom? We're perched headlong in the edge of boredom. We're reaching for death on the end of a candle. We're trying for something that's already found us. Jim was so smart, he was aware of that. I mean, the public was prejudiced from right away, and rightly so, because he set him up. Morrison biographer, Danny Sugarman. It was his fault, and he knew it, and he knew in order to be himself, he'd have to suffer the consequences, and he was afraid. No matter what he did, man, he could have written the most brilliant poetry ever, our orbs ever glimpsed, and it still wasn't as good as Strange Days. He knew it. I mean, how can you stop drinking with that hanging over your head? The world on fire. Taxi from Africa, the Grand Hotel, he was drunk. A big party last night. Back, going back in all directions, sleeping these insane hours. I'll never wake up in a good mood again. I'm sick of these stinky boots. That awakening must have been very painful. 
It's a perfect, brilliant tragedy. I mean, he was a shooting star. And he was the most brilliant shooting star anybody will ever see in the medium of rock and roll. I mean, he went from great to horrible so quickly and so brilliantly. It's, it's terrifying when you consider that the man was aware of every single move he made and could have sustained his appeal. Very, he could have very easily sustained his appeal. Kept his weight down, shaved his beard, and written that poetry and, and kept jumping off stages, but he wouldn't. He learned too quick. John Densmore. He was just trying to change. It, it, just that thing that, that I hated about him, but I loved about him. You know, he, he gained a few pounds and grew a beard and all, and actually, in retrospect, I can see he was just trying to grow. Well, I've been down so goddamn long That it looks like up to me Well, I've been down so very damn long That it looks like up to me
Resurrection. Mm -hmm. Resurrection of Jim Morrison, born again. Born again through his words, through his poetry. Ray Manzarek. That's what we wanted to do. We wanted the world to be aware that Jim Morrison is a brilliant poet. A great rock and roll entertainer, a great star man, a guy who would get on stage and just go crazy right in front of your very eyes. All the things everyone said about him, they love him, they hate him. I understand it, I loved him and hated him too. But he's also a great poet and saying some really great things that have nothing to do with the 60s, with the 70s, with the 80s, with the 20s, with the 30s, with the 40s that have to do with being alive on this planet. Everybody who's listening to this show right now shares one thing in common. We are all alive. We are all on this planet right now. Right here, right now. It's all we have together, our life. And that's what Jim Morrison is talking about. I tell you this, no eternal reward will forgive us now for wasting the dawn. We'll be back with the conclusion of tonight's interview in just a moment. We'll continue now with our interview of The Doors and Ray Manzarek as he explains why Jim Morrison was known not only as The Doors' lead singer, lyricist, and poet, but also as Jim Morrison, the shaman. Well, what the shaman was, was a medicine man, sort of, of a lot of primitive tribes mainly in Siberia is the last ones that, that we know about, uh, primitive tribes up in Siberia. But uh, the shaman was the medicine man who wasn't necessarily in charge of healing, but who was the, the visionary, the seer of the tribe, the tribe's visionary leader. He would go into trances. The people would, they'd have special, special days and special feast days and ceremonies where all the people would sit around and play on drums and rattles and play rhythms and the shaman would stand in the middle of this circle of people and go into a trance and his spirit would leave his body and he'd go on these psychedelic voyages, psychedelic journeys in which he would see what might be wrong with somebody in the tribe, what the weather is going to be like next year, what the harvest is going to be, what kind of weather is coming, what kind of uh, psychic crisis this tribe might be going through. He was a spiritual guide, and Jim Morrison was that same kind of guide. On stage, uh, a Doris concert became a, a, a shamanistic rite. I tripped out all the time, yeah. I'd be playing and trip myself out on what I was playing. And uh, Jim would be gone in the first five minutes. John and Robbie and I would start the rhythms going, and five minutes after we'd start, Jim would be gone, man. He'd be off, and we'd be following him. Sometimes we'd lead him, other times he'd lead us, we'd follow him, he'd follow us, and the audience would follow the four of us. And we'd go on these little voyages, little excursions into the dark side of the soul and into the light, and into the weird side, into sex, into violence, into the boogeyman, into God. So it would just be journeys, swimming, swimming through the void. So that's what the shaman was. The rhythm was a very fundamental part of it. He had to have that rhythm around him in order to trip out. And he was just tripping out, that's what he was doing. Tripping out in a, in a very uh, ancient way. And uh, that's nothing different than what Jim Morrison was doing. There will never be another one like you. There will never be another one who can do the things you do. Oh, will you give another chance? Will you try, little try? Please stop and you remember we were together anyway. All right. And if you have a certain evening you can lend to me, I'll give it all right back to you. Now how it has to be. Oh my. 
Concert promoter and longtime friend of the Doors, Rich Linnell. My first encounter with Jim, this meeting of him, I, I noticed that he, he had this same kind of power, charisma, whatever you want to call it, over other people. And even in large groups of people, not on stage, which of course was apparent. Uh, and I, I remember a couple of situations in dressing room scenes, and I don't know anybody that's familiar with the dressing room scene knows that it's rather hectic and a lot of people. And Jim would walk in the room um, by himself, and he might acknowledge a few people, say hello, and then he'd go sit down, and he'd sit very silently, kind of very reflective looking. And over the course of the next five, ten minutes, the buzz of the room would just slowly diminish, till after ten minutes or so, there was dead silence. And either out of consideration or who knows, but they just would all of a sudden fall and there was just huge silence that would just come over the room. It's something you, you remember. You know, the force of the man was, was very, very prominent. Will you stop? Will you stop? The pain. There will never be another one like you. Thank you, do oh, will you give another chance? Will you try, little try? Please stop and you remember we were together anyway. All right, how you must have thinking one. I think that his importance should not be underestimated because I really think that his art was changing people. Once again, Bill Siddons. I think that when you walked out of a Doris concert, you walked out changed. Your perception was altered, and it wasn't some transitory, drug-induced, wow, I saw the light kind of thing. It was something where Jim showed you. He got up there, and either you said, this guy is completely nuts, and I'm never going to do this again, or you said, we could do anything. I could do anything. To me, he showed us all the possibility of change and the possibility of growth, because he lived it, and he, he was it.
I hope you've enjoyed tonight's show and that you'll be with us next week for the conclusion of our four-part special interview of The Doors, when we will look deeper into Jim Morrison, the poet, and The Doors' tribute to his poetic genius in the album American Prayer. Join us next week, same time and same frequency, for part four of our interview of The Doors. I'm Jim Ladd. Good evening, everybody. I'm Jim Ladd. Tonight, the fourth and final part of our interview of The Doors. In the first three parts of this special, we learned how The Doors met in Venice Beach, California, and at UCLA. We've listened to some extraordinary tales ranging from LSD experimentation to the police, from riotous concerts to visionary dreams and nightmarish realities. Through it all, Every person who we have met during these last three weeks has acknowledged the craziness and applauded the insanity that the doors were able to create. And what in the final outcome was the cause of all of this chaos and disorder? The doors music. Something in the combination of the lyrical and musical vibrations created by this band has yet to be explained. Given only 27 years on this planet, Jim Morrison became possibly the most mysterious and controversial rock and roll star in history. Tonight, we have once again gathered together Ray Manzarek, John Densmore, Robbie Krieger, and a feast of friends for a very special purpose. For tonight, we will honor James Douglas Morrison, poet. Resurrection. Mm -hmm. Resurrection of Jim Morrison, born again. Cancel my subscription to the resurrection. Born again through his words, through his poetry. Send my credentials to the house of detention. That's what we wanted to do. I got some friends inside. We wanted the world to be aware that Jim Morrison is a brilliant poet. The face in the mirror won't stop. The girl in the window won't drop. A feast of friends, alive she cried, waiting for me. A great rock and roll entertainer, a great star man, a guy who would get on stage and just go crazy right in front of your very eyes. All the things everyone said about him, they love him, they hate him. I understand it, I loved him, hated him too. But he's also a great poet. When the still sea conspires in armor and her sullen and aborted currents breed tiny monsters, True sailing is dead. Awkward instant, and the first animal is jettisoned. Legs furiously pumping their stiff green gallop, and heads bob up.
Tonight, we will focus on An American Prayer, The Doors tribute to Jim Morrison, an album which took Ray Manzarek, John Densmore, and Robbie Krieger three years to make and is truly a labor of love and hope. The hope that An American Prayer will be heard and that Jim Morrison will be recognized for the poet that he was. Ray Manzarek. Let me give you and the uh, audience a clue as to what we had in mind. This is Jim's story, told in Jim's own words, from birth to death. We've got Jim Morrison, the child, Jim Morrison in high school, Jim Morrison, the acid poet, the last part of side one, then the public life of Jim Morrison, The Doors, side two, ladies and gentlemen from Los Angeles, California, The Doors. And you hear the, uh, the concert get insane at the end of it, the end of the song. That's the career of The Doors getting crazy, uh, Doors audiences getting crazy, Doors concerts getting too crazy for any of us. And Jim finally getting out of that, going on the run, Riders on the Storm. And then finally, uh, An American Prayer, in which Jim sums it all up, his final work, his great statement at the end. So that's what we had in mind with the album. When you sat down with uh, you and Robbie and John to start this, can you kind of describe what you first had to work with? I mean, what did you, was first facing you? I, I have a, a vision of it, like a giant room of dusty tapes and, <laughs> that are not labeled and... <laughs> very close to that, yeah, very close. Uh, on Jim's birthday, his last birthday on this planet, as far as we know, December 8th, 1970, he went into the recording studio and sort of treated himself to a birthday present of recording some of his poetry. So we had about four or five hours of stuff from that session and uh, we also had uh, some other tapes of uh, outtakes from the live album. We had things from um, Jim Morrison's uh, movie, the, a movie that he was uh, working on, uh, something called Highway. So the job was uh, putting it uh, into an album. It was Jim's words would set off images in your head and those images would uh, call moods to mind. Uh, couples naked race down beach, quiet, moonlit night, all that sort of thing. And the feeling we got from it was one of a, uh, a sort of a, a birth, a primal birth kind of sequence. And uh, we felt that the music for that had to be a kind of primitive primeval, the word that Jim always used, a pr the primeval rhythm, the basic rhythms of sex, the basic rhythm of humanity, the rhythm of uh, copulation, a rhythm of creation. And uh, John started the beat. We know it's got to have this kind of primitive beat. I was always seeing things when we'd play, and this album was the same way. It, uh, it was full of, full of verbal images that uh, would create pictures in your mind, and what we'd try to do is match our music to the pictures that were created in our minds. The collective door is mine. Awake. Shake dreams from your hair, my pretty child, my sweet one. Choose the day and choose the sign of your day, the day's divinity. First thing you see. A vast, radiant beach and a cool, jeweled moon. Couples naked race down by its quiet side. And we laugh like soft, mad children smug in the woolly cotton brains of infancy. The music and voices are all around us. Dances. 
it was like the four of us recreating it or doing it to doing it new for the first time. Jim came over the earphones. We were laying down the tracks. At a certain point, I'd nod over at John Haney, and he'd hit the tape that had uh, Jim's voice on it. And in would come Jim on the earphones, just as if he was in the vocal booth. And uh, a couple of times, uh, I looked over, you know, as if to go, yeah, man, out of sight. And I realized he wasn't there. You know, there was nobody in the vocal booth. It was all in our heads. But his presence was there. Gently they stir, gently rise, the dead or newborn awakening, with ravaged limbs and wet souls, gently they sigh in rapt funeral amazement. Who called these dead to dance? Was it the young woman learning to play the ghost song in her baby grand? Was it the wilderness children? Was it the ghost god himself, stuttering, cheering, chatting blindly? I called you up to anoint the earth. I called you to announce sadness falling like burned skin. I called you to wish you well, to glory in self like a new monster, and now I call on you to pray. I'm Jim Ladd, and we're back with our interview of The Doors, and Ray Manzarek, as we continue with the album, An American Prayer. What Jim is talking about in this album are glimpses of moments in time, moments in reality, riding on that bus to high school. And in the high school dances, that day-to-day -day reality, man, Jim was there, we were all there. Jim shared it with all of us. We all have that in common. Can we resolve the past, lurking jaws, joints of time, the base, to come of age in a dry place, holes and caves? My friend drove an hour each day from the mountains. The bus gives you a hard-on with books in your lap. Someone shot the bird in the afternoon dance show. They gave out free records to the best couple. Spades dance best from the hip. The Doors manager, Bill Siddons. When I heard the final record, I was stunned, and I, I mean, it took me a couple minutes to be able to talk. What they did was what they did from the first time they played together. They took Jim's poetry, which is powerful, unique, and I believe very, very important poetry, but they, they took it that extra level and made it something that everyone could experience. I believe that the record that they made with Jim's words and their music is something that, <laughs> like the doors of uh, old, is unique in time and is an incredibly powerful experience. And you're right, it proves that uh, there is no doubt about it. The doors, as the three musicians, were Jim's vehicle to reaching people. He would have never accomplished what he did without them, and vice versa. The music was new, black, polished chrome and came over the summer like liquid night. The DJs took pills to stay awake and play for seven days. They went to the studio and someone knew him. Someone knew the TV showman. He came to our homeroom party and played records and when he left in the hot noon sun and walked to his car, we saw the Chukes had written F-U-C-K on his windshield. He wiped it off with a white rag and smiling coolly drove away. He's rich, got a big car. My gang will get you. of rape in the Arroyo. Seductions in cars, abandoned buildings. Fights at the food stand. Dust. dust, dust.
open shirts and raised collars. Bright sculptured hair. This place has everything. Come on, I show you. So Jim was on the street, man, with all of us. We were all there on the street. But he was also in the ozone. He was in heaven. He was in hell. He was experiencing as much of life as he could. That's why, in a way, when at 27, when he was gone, I wasn't really too sad because I, he lived a full life. He wasn't 27. He was 67, 77 when he died. He lived life to the fullest, man. He just said, take it as it comes, but take as much of it as you can. Just absorb everything in life. Live life with great intensity, because it's life. It's the only one you've got. And you may be back, but you ain't going to be back the way you are now. You're going to be different. So this is what you got right now. And by God, live it and enjoy it. Angels and sailors, rich girls, backyard fences, tents, Dreams watching each other narrowly, soft, luxuriant cars, girls in garages stripped out to get liquor and clothes, half gallons of wine and six packs of beer. Jumped, humped, born to suffer, made to undress in the wilderness. The sexual experiences of high school, that's what he's talking about, man. Jumped, humped, Born to suffer, made to undress in the wilderness. That's like girls being taken out in the cars and uh, forced to do things by uh, these rough guys. And, uh, and then there's the story of the guy, the playground instructor and his girls. That's the, uh, that's the sexual side of high school. That's what goes on. We all know it goes on in high school. Jim's putting it down in uh, poetry. He's telling you exactly what you've experienced, but he's just putting it in a, in a poetic form. He was reflecting what he saw. He was just writing it down in a different way. He wasn't being a reporter, he was being a poet. This uh, little blues riff that you guys included here, mm -hmm. that sounds like it was recorded through a Dixie cup and a string. Yeah. Where, well, where did that come it from? It practically was. I'll tell you a few things where they came from and other things I'm not gonna tell you where they came from. But on this one, I'll tell you where it came okay. from. This was uh, Norman Mailer, an American writer was running for mayor of New York City and uh, there was a benefit performance done in uh, Los Angeles to try to raise some money for him and uh, Jim Morrison recited some of his poems and uh, Robbie was there too and Robbie plugged in his guitar and uh, played a couple of old blues songs and uh, that's where that comes from. Uh, so it was a benefit performance somebody recorded on it. Right, recorded on a uh, little cracker box tape recorder. I will never treat you mean Never start no kind of scene And I tell you Every place and person That I've been Always a playground instructor, never a killer. Always a bridesmaid, on the verge of fame or over, he maneuvered two girls into his hotel room. One a friend, the other, the young one, a newer stranger, vaguely Mexican or Puerto Rican. Poor boy's thighs and buttocks scarred by a father's belt. She's trying to rise story of her boyfriend of teenage stone death games handsome lad dead in a car confusion no connections come here i love you peace on earth will you die for me eat me this way the end i'll always be true 
never go out sneaking out on you, babe. You lonely, show me far out in a I'm surprised you could get it up. He whips her lightly, sardonically with belt. Haven't I been through enough, she asks, now dressed and leaving. The Spanish girl begins to bleed. She says her period. It's Catholic heaven. I have an ancient Indian crucifix around my neck. My chest is hard and brown. Lying on stained, wretched sheets with a bleeding virgin. We could plan a murder or start a religion. I tell you this, no eternal reward will forgive us now for wasting the dawn. Back in those days, everything was simpler and more confused. One summer night, going to the pier, I ran into two young girls. The blonde was called Freedom, the dark one, Enterprise. We talked, and they told me the story. Now listen to this. I'll tell you about Texas you about Radio and the Big Beat. Soft, driven, slow and mad like some new language. Reaching your head with the cold, sudden fury of a divine messenger. Let me tell you about heartache and the loss of God, wandering, wandering in hopeless night. Out here in the perimeter, there are no stars, out here, we is stoned, immaculate. He was reflecting what he saw. He was just writing it down in a different way. He wasn't being a reporter, he was being a poet. He was just changing the words slightly, putting it into a poetic framework so that one line captured uh, what a paragraph would take to capture, what a page of prose writing. And poetry, you can capture that in one sentence, in one, in one line of poetry, and that's what Jim would do. It's very easy to understand. It's just when you think about uh, Jim Morrison's poetry as uh, what he was seeing around him and capsulizing it, writing it in as short a way as he could possibly write. And that's what poetry is. Very simple. An easy album to understand. If we move on to section mm -hmm. three, mm -hmm. perhaps. The movie. The movie, the movie will, will begin, begin in five, five moments, moments, the mindless voice announced. We're back now with our interview at the doors. And during this segment, you will hear an interview exclusive, a piece by Jim Morrison entitled Cemetery Poem, never before published or heard on the radio. Now relax and be seated. Our interview continues. The movie will begin in five moments, the mindless voice announced. All those unseated will await the next show. So the movie, now this is uh, kind of like a description of this album, really. A lot of people have said that this album is a movie on vinyl. That's it's exactly what we intended to do, right? Yeah. It's a movie soundtrack, and the movie exists only in your mind. And each listener sees his own movie, sees it a different way. But all we did was give you the soundtrack to the movie. You have to make up the movie in your own mind. And the movie itself, the poem about the movie, is uh, Jim on a rooftop in Venice after he had graduated college and was just lying around waiting for the next phase of his life to begin, stoned on acid, writing these uh, bizarre poems about being out there somewhere, somewhere out on the perimeter where there are no stars, where everyone was stoned, immaculate. And they were in a movie theater. And a show began, and Jim was telling you what he saw. We filed slowly, languidly into the hall. The auditorium was vast and silent. 
As we seated and were darkened, the voice continued. The program for this evening is not new. You have seen this entertainment through and through. You've seen your birth, your life and death. You might recall all of the rest. Did you have a good world when you died? Enough to base a movie on? Two subjects, both interrelated, were explored over and over again by Jim Morrison in his writings. Sex and death. Whether in his songs, poems, or onstage improvisations, the subject of sex, somehow linked with death, was a constant theme. Concert promoter Rich Linnell. Sex and death. Well, I heard it explained to me at one point that uh, life began with sex and ends with death. I pressed her thigh and death smiled. I think if you go back over history and you look at a lot of philosophers, uh, writers, many times their theme was death. They were dealing with death. And in Jim's writing there, I, I sense a, he has come to terms with it. He understands it. He doesn't fear it. And at, at that point, one becomes free. If you fear death, if you fear dying all the time, then chances are you're going to fear a lot of other things, too. And when you start to fear a lot of other things, then it's, it's real hard to, to be a free human being. Thoughts in time and out of season. The hitchhiker stood by the side of the road and leveled his thumb in the calm calculus of reason. Hi, how are you doing? I just got back into town. L.A. I was out on the desert for a while. Yeah? Um, in the middle of it. Right. Hey, listen, man, I really got a problem. Well, uh, when I was out on the desert, man, uh, tell you, but uh, I killed somebody. No, it's no big deal, you know, I don't think anybody will find out about it. Just, uh, yeah, this guy gave me a ride and uh, started giving me a lot of trouble and I just couldn't take it. Uh, Ray said that you, that L.A. Woman was really the mark of a brand new direction that the doors are really turning to. Doors guitarist, Robbie Krieger. Yeah, that's true. It could have really happened from there on, you know, because, you know, I think Riders on the Storm is probably the most, uh, I don't know, it could be the best song we've ever done, I think. I'm not saying it's the best song we ever wrote because it's not, but as far as the, uh, the way it was produced and uh, just the sound of it, you know, I really dug it. I think that could have gone off on into a new direction for us. But that was not to be. For on the 3rd of July, 1971, Jim Morrison died in a hotel room in Paris, France. Now, eight years later, the cause and the manner in which he died is still shrouded in mystery. The official reason given by the French coroner was a heart attack at age 27. But as you are listening to this program right now, the questions, theories, speculations, and rumors still persist. And for the most part, they remain unanswered. This final scene of Jim Morrison's movie began with a phone call to the Doors manager, Bill Siddons. <sighs> Very bizarre experience. The phone rings at 4 or 4.30 in the morning and wakes both my wife and I out of a deep sleep. My wife sits up and says, something happened to Jim. And I looked at her and said, what? Just a second. I answered the phone. And it was Clive Selwood telling me that uh, three writers had called him and told him that they had heard that Jim had died and did I know anything? And I said, no, 
I mean, for me, you have to understand, by July 5th, 1971, I was pretty jaded <laughs> about the stories about Jim. Jim died 14 times. Yeah, right. <laughs> died 14 times, had 4,000 illegitimate children, and, <laughs> you know, all that kind of crap. I see. He was, in fact, right. happy and stable in Paris. I talked to him probably three times while he was in Paris, and each time that I talked to him, I felt like I was talking to uh, the Jim that I knew in his most relaxed and um, personal moments that we ever had together. You know, Jim went to Paris to leave rock and roll behind and, and go as a writer. Um, about noon on Monday, I finally got through to the apartment in Paris. And uh, I spoke to Pamela and asked her, you know, told her that I'd heard this and asked her what, what was happening. And she said, oh, no, it's, you know, it's all craziness, nothing's happening. But I detected a note of insincerity in her voice. So I just really leveled with her and said, Look, Pamela, I want you to know I'm calling as a friend. I'm not calling as a businessman. I have, if anything happened to Jim, he's my friend and I loved him and I want to do anything possible to help you, that's all. And she said, oh, and thought about it for a second and then leveled with me and told me what had happened. So I just said, I'll get the next plane out of town and I'll be there to help you. And that's exactly what I did. I got a plane, I think, at 4 o'clock that afternoon, <coughs> which gets you into... Paris, 6 o'clock in the morning, the next morning, or whatever. And I got in and went straight over to the apartment, and, um, boy. <laughs> Jim had been dead probably two days. So, um, there were, um, three other people who were there and helping. There were French people that were friends of theirs that were dealing with, um, helping deal with some of the government officials and do this and do that. They managed to get Jim buried as a poet in the ground in Père Lachaise, which he had been to just, you know, the week prior to his death, he'd gone through the cemetery. And Père Lachaise is an incredible place. I mean, this cemetery has been there for 500 years. And people like, um, I believe Rimbaud is buried there, Victor Hugo, Edith Piaf, all the great cultural figures of, you know, French history. And um, the French people arranged to get Jim buried at Père Lachaise, which he you know, obviously it was his wish to be buried amongst literary greats and people that, that he had respected his whole life. We scaled the wall, we tripped through the graveyard. Ancient shapes were all around us. No music, but the wet grass felt fresh beside the fog. Two made love in a silent spot. One chased a rabbit into the dark. A girl got drunk and bawled the dead, and I gave empty sermons to my head. Cemetery cool and quiet, hate to leave your sacred lay. Dread the milky coming of the day. I'd love to stay. Riders on I'd the love storm. to stay. I'd love to stay. Riders on the storm. Into this house we're born. world we're thrown like a dog without a bone and actor out alone riders on the storm there's a killer on the road his brain is squirming like a toad take a I know each other at least well enough that when it's someone close to you like that you have no ghoulish aspirations of well I must see the body to be sure or any of that but you were at that time the manager of the doors I mean you had their financial and life in your hands you were the man Bill you did not check that out I know the question uh, no I didn't Jim I look what happened was it never occurred to me. I had just buried my father a couple of years before that, and I almost punched out the funeral directors because I left the casket open, and I just found it horrendous. So to me, uh, 
Like I said, I started being your manager when I was 18, I think. Um, and at that point, I was still only 22 or 23, not, uh, you know, knowledgeable in the worldly ways. And I mean, I went there as Jim's friend. I went there to bury a friend, and I had absolutely no sense of professional responsibility. It never occurred to me that I had to see the body or should see the body. I didn't need to. I knew from Pamela, I mean, I knew these people. You know, I knew that Jim was dead. That's the only stickler is that nobody has, that I know has seen the body. Robbie Krieger. And uh, the only person who knew one way or the other was Pam, who is now deceased. How did she know? She was with him. She was there. But she had plenty of time to clear that up before she, she died. Is that not true? Uh, well, what do you mean by clear it up? Again, this is, this is a question. That... So there was no autopsy. I mean, isn't it kind of rare for someone in his position? Yeah. yeah. Is this on the tape? Would you rather it not be? And turn it off for a second. Okay. The conclusion of our four-part interview of the doors in just a moment. And now, the final segment of Interview's four-part special on The Doors. We will begin with another unreleased poem by Jim Morrison, never before heard on radio. It's entitled, Hitler. Adolf Hitler is still alive. Boos. I slept with her last night. Yeah! Come out from behind that false mustache, Adolf. I know you're in there. Ha <laughs> You favor life. He sides with death. I straddle the fence. And my balls hurt. All right. All right, here's the story as I know it. This is what everybody in Radio Land will get. Ray Manzarek. The death certificate said, in French, the translation was, his heart stopped. And uh, it never listed any cause. And maybe the translation is wrong, but saying his heart stopped is like saying he's, he stopped breathing. Well, you know he stopped breathing. You know his heart stopped when he died. Uh, how did he die? What caused his heart to stop is what we want to know. Would be a relevant question, yeah. I would assume. <laughs> it's automatic, but uh, these, this is a French, this is the French night court doctor. I guess this was called your local mor mortician, or what's he called? The, uh, the, the coroner. coroner yes. right? He was the night coroner. And there's another story or two uh, that I can't think of offhand that adds further complications to it. So I don't know. I don't know what happened. Are you suggesting by any chance that he did not die? I am telling you the story, and uh, I wouldn't be surprised. I would be surprised. I would think it would be brilliant, absolutely brilliant, if Jim was in Africa. Who knows? Maybe he did give it all up and went to Africa. You remember when we were in Africa? Why is there a question? I ask myself. Well, I could give standard answer number three. The Doors drummer, John Densmore. Maybe I, I'm charmed by the idea, the romantic idea that he is still alive. But I have to say that if there's anybody who'd do it, he'd do it. He's the only guy I've ever known in my life that I could think that would do something like that. Let's reinvent the gods, all the myths of the ages. Celebrate symbols from deep elder forests. Have you forgotten the lessons of the ancient war? We need great golden copulations. The fathers are cackling in trees of the forest. Our mother is dead in the sea. 
You know we are being led to slaughters by placid admirals and that fat, slow generals are getting obscene on young blood. You know we are ruled by TV. The moon is a dry blood beast. Gorilla bands are rolling numbers in the next block of green vine, amassing for warfare on innocent herdsmen who are just dying. O oh, great creator of being, grant us one more hour to perform our art and perfect our lives. The moths and atheists are doubly divine and dying. We live, we die, and death not ends it. We got our final vision by clap. Columbus's groin got filled with green death. Touched her thigh and death smiled. During the recording of American Prayer, it was said by everyone involved that at one time or another, Jim Morrison's presence would be felt in the studio as the taping was taking place. I wanted to know from Ray Manzarek if this had happened on any other occasion. No, only in the studio, uh, in working on an American Prayer, did, uh, did we sort of collectively feel uh, Jim's presence there. On the third meeting, listening to the tapes, a little bird flew in and just kind of fluttered around the room for a little while, fluttered over everybody's head, and then flew out an open window. And we all looked at each other and said, here he is, he was here, fluttered over us and gave us his little blessing and said, okay, you guys, you, you know what I want, now do it the right way for me, and flew out the window. This came directly after you had made, finally said, okay, let's do it. Mm -hmm. Take that for what it's worth, a coincidence. Interesting, because birds have been uh, used as symbols for as long as we got history, as far as things like that. Yeah, the soul, mm -hmm. the fluttering soul. The word man came by as a bird man and fluttered over us and fluttered out. I'll always be a word man, better than a bird man. Crucifixion. They crucified Jim Morrison on his own genitals. I think he was crucified in the press. I think he was crucified in the public's mind. They crucified his spirit. It wasn't a cross. They crucified him on a phallus, a phallic symbol. He was crucified because he dared to speak about phallic things. And you can't do that. But in the future, we'll be able to talk about anything and take it as a very normal part of life. But beca because he dared speak about it in this Puritan society we live in, we are still a puritanical society, he was crucified. And now he's not with us. Now all we have left of the man are his words to guide us. Give us a creed to believe in night of lust. Give us trust in the night. Give of color hundred hues, a rich mandala for me and you. And for your silky pillowed house, a head, wisdom, and a bed. Troubled decree, resolute mockery has claimed thee. And we're lucky we had him. We're lucky he was around. He won't be around again. They don't come by often, those types. You get them once in a generation, once in a decade, once every 50 years, maybe. You know how pale and wanton and thrillful comes death in a strange hour, unannounced, unplanned for, like a scaring, over-friendly guest you've brought to bed. Death makes angels of us all and gives us wings where we had shoulders smooth as raven's claws. Money, no more fancy dress. This other kingdom seems by far the best until its other jaw reveals incest and loose obedience to a vegetable law. I will not go. Prefer a feast of friends to the giant family.
I think we've had our Jim Morrison now. I don't think another one will be along for a long time. And I miss him, frankly. This is the end, beautiful friend. This is the end, my only friend, the end. It hurts to set you free, but you'll never follow me. There are many people who deserve thanks for the realization of this four-part interview of The Doors. The first is Interviews producer and engineer Bill Levy. Without the contribution of his talent and creativity, this certainly would have been an impossible venture. Secondly, Morrison biographer Danny Sugarman, who stuck with this project from beginning to end and was an inspirational factor throughout. Special thanks are due to The Doors manager Bill Siddons and concert promoter Rich Linnell for their trust and patience. Also, to Jack Snyder of KMET for The Stone. My personal thanks to my partner, Jack Morris, for believing in me enough to wait two years for this show to be completed. Thanks also to Robbie Carroll and Kurt Daniels, and special thanks to the people at Electra Asylum Records. Finally, my sincere gratitude to Ray Manzarek, Robbie Krieger, John Densmore, and Jim Morrison for the music and the poetry that have opened so many doors for me. I'm Jim Ladd.